my next presenter is Chad Ashley. He's been a huge pillar of the community for years and developing tools and sharing techniques, tutorials, and so much more over at Grayscale Gorilla. Let's give him a big round of applause, folks. Hey, hey, hey. How you guys doing? So let's get this thing started, shall we? All right, let's do a uh, slideshow. That's not always fun on a Thursday morning. Hope everybody's show going, is going well. I'm going to give you a little brief introduc introduction. My name is Chad Ashley. I am a creative director at Grayscale Gorilla, where I create and uh, help users uh, with tools, training, and tutorials. Uh, been there, actually, today is my uh, three-year anniversary, so I've been there for three years now. Uh, so I'm starting my fourth year extremely tired and <laughs> ready to, to demo some awesome stuff for all of you here and at home. Uh, but before I uh, do that, I'm going to play down our customer reel. We have some of the most amazing customers in the world using our tools and training, so we like to show them off whenever we can. So that's just a taste of some of the work our customers do. Uh, it's fantastic to see the work that they, they put out into the world using our, our tools and our training, our assets. It's, a, it's always really fulfilling. So uh, with that, I want to say thank you to everyone out there watching here uh, live and online. And thank you to Maxon and all the awesome presenters that we've seen this week. Uh, it's been a huge honor to uh, be a part of this show for a couple of years now. And uh, it's a great, great group of people. So thank you very much, everyone. So, what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about, if you haven't guessed by the cheesy GIF, Field of Dreams, right? Anybody here guess that? Yeah, of course. So we're going to talk about Fields today. Fields is probably one of my favorite new things added in Cinema 4D uh, since I started using the application. It's a fantastic tool, it's a fantastic tool set, fantastic way to work, and we're going to break down some of the, uh, uh, some of the workflows using Fields, and we're going to build a fun procedural toy city in fields with Cinema 4D. So all of this in the background there was created with fields, and we're going to show you how to do that very easily. So we're going to create a toy city with cool little parks and whatnot. So in particular, what are we talking about? Like I mentioned, we're going to talk about fields. But a lot of people have been using fields to do like vertex map growth and vertex selections. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to use fields to drive polygon selections. And with those polygon selections, we're going to grow cities out of those polygon selections using MoGraph cloners. We're going to talk about field groups. We're going to talk about quantized falloffs. So quantized falloffs is probably uh, the most uh, uh, nerdy thing you could possibly say to somebody. <laughs> so if you want to sound really smart, uh, just walk up at somebody and say, yeah, I only use quantized falloffs, because it just sounds really, really cool. Uh, we're going to talk about new multi-instance multi cloners, which allows you to clone insane amounts of geometry using MoGraph in Cinema 4D. We're going to see how far we can push this, and then we're going to go and light it up in Redshift, do some rendering at the end, make it fun. All right, so with that said, let's jump in, shall we? All right, we're going to jump into Cinema 4D. And you can see right here, we have a pretty simple scene. We've got a, a plane with a wood texture on it. It's like a, like a plank, maybe a piece of plywood. And off to the side here, we have some Mogra, or sorry, we have some uh, Happy Toolbox buildings. So we sell a really cool little model pack called the Happy Toolbox model pack. And it's got some really neat buildings and some trees. So these are the, the assets that we're going to clone across this piece of wood here to get our city going. All right, so the first thing we want to do is actually create a MoGraph cloner. If you're not familiar with the MoGraph cloner, it's a fantastic way to duplicate objects, animate objects. It's a really robust part of Cinema 4D. So I'm just grabbing all of my buildings and making them a child of this cloner. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to create a bunch of clones of that building. In our case, it's going to create three by default here. We're going to change some of these cloner settings, go under the mode, and we're going to change this mode from, from linear to object, which basically is going to mean that we want to drive this poly or drive this cloner with an object. We're going to duplicate buildings onto an object. So with the cloner selected, go down here. We have an input here for an object. We're going to drag our ground plane down into that. And instantly, we're going to have our buildings cloning across this piece of wood. They're all laying down flat. We don't want that. So I'm going to turn off a line, which they're all going to pop up straight in the air. And we're going to put these all over this plane. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with a distribution. Instead of using a surface di distribution, which is just putting them randomly across the surface, we want to put them on the polygon center of each one of these uh, polygons. So if I come over here and I say, let's just look at this in quick shade with lines. Each one of these polygons is going to get a building, right? So let's go back into quick shade. So we're going to change that distribution mode to polygon center. And instantly, we're going to get buildings on every polygon center. And it's actually pretty, pretty responsive. We're getting a pretty good frame rate here. We've got a lot of buildings going on. But we need to change a few things. So with that, we're going to come over to our cloner. And we're going to change how we want these to be instanced. Right now, they are using the default instance mode. But new in R20, we have the multi-instance mode. And with that, we have the ability to change exactly how these are displayed in our viewport, which is really, really powerful. If you have a lot of high poly geometry being instanced across your surface or in your scene, it can really bog you down. So using a multi-instance mode is going to make that much faster. In fact, the other viewport modes are pretty cool, too. We have points where they're just they're just displayed as points. Or we can use bounding boxes. If you have really high poly geo, you just need to see the bounding boxes. In our case, we've got pretty low poly buildings. So we can use off, and we, or sorry, not off, but use object to see the actual buildings there. So all right, that's pretty good. But they're all very uniform. In fact, we want to change that. We want to make them a little bit more random. So let's do that. We're going to change the clone mode to iterate from iterate to random, which is basically just going to choose random buildings to distribute across this plane. Right. So we have a ton of objects now. All right. So now it's time to start using some fields. So as I was mentioning before, a lot of people have been using fields to drive vertex map selections. But we're going to use it to drive polygon selections. So in order to do that, I'm going to grab my ground plane, and we're going to go into polygon selection mode. I'm going to move over here. I'm just going to select this one polygon in the corner, right over there. And from there, I'm going to say select, and I'm going to say set selection. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a polygon selection tag. So that selection, that polygon selection is stored in this little tag. And we're going to name this tag buildings. Okay, And if you notice, with vertex map selections, there was a little fields tick. And the same thing goes for polygon selections. We have a little fields tick right here that we can enable to get into our fields. right? So let's enable that. So now we're using fields. And nothing is really changing yet. So what do we need to do to make our polygon selection drive our cloner? right? Because remember, we were going to have our polygon selection drive our cloner. So we go back into the cloner. There's a little selection input down here in our cloner. All you have to do is take your polygon selection and drag it into that input. And boom, we get one building exactly where we had our polygon selection before, right? Very, very intuitive, very easy to understand. So now we just need to start using some fields to drop down some building ex exactly where we want them. So with that, I'm going to come over here to my fields, and we're going to talk about fields for a minute. Before I start to jump into building the city, I really wanted to try to turn a light bulb in in everybody's head about how fields work. Because when I started using fields, it was sort of like hard for me to like grasp what it was. In a nutshell, fields are a more sort of technical expansion of Cinema 4D's fall off system, sort of all wrapped in something that looks and feels like Photoshop. So it's very familiar, but it's extremely powerful, right? So once you start to think about, oh, it's like Photoshop. I know Photoshop layers and transfer modes and things like that. Fields will come very easily to you. So let's just demo that really quickly here. So I'm going to delete. It, by default, it's going to put a freeze layer in here, which is basically going to say I'm holding on to the selection that I made into that, into that polygon selection. So let's go ahead and delete that. And we're going to put down a solid. And this is no different than putting down a solid in Photoshop, right? A solid white. Imagine this is a solid white. So a polygon selection doesn't have any in-between states. It's either selected or it's not selected. White, selected. Black, not selected. So if this value of this solid is white, like it is right now, we get buildings on every polygon, because every polygon is being selected. 
If I drag this value down below 50%, they all go away because that value does not know any in-betweens. It's a binary, it's zero or one. So no polygon selected, all polygon selected. All buildings, no buildings. So I hope that's tracking. So let's go ahead and grab a, they have these neat little things down here. We have the ability to add field objects. We have the ability to add uh, field layers. And then of course we have the modifier layers. And this is very much like Photoshop. It's really not that much different. In fact, let's grab a spherical uh, fall off which you may know if, you, if you're familiar with the falloff system in cinema. And we're going to set its blending mode or transfer mode to subtract, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to cut a hole in our city, right? We're cutting a hole in our city. And it's very interactive because we're using the multi-instance, very easy to, to, do, to use. And from here, we could do something else. Maybe we want to add, I don't know, a random field, right? We'll use a random field in here, and we'll set that one. You can see it broke up that selection. We're going to set this to overlay. And now what that's doing is it's like creating a noise. And it's going to break up the in-between value. It's going to break up that edge of our, of our spherical field, right? So you can see it's no longer like a perfect sphere. Then what we could do, come down here and grab that again, we could add a invert to this, right? It's almost like in Photoshop adding an adjustment layer at that point. I'm inverting this, right? So now I've just inverted that selection. Now we're only putting buildings where we need them. And now we can move our city around. We've got a nice organic edge to it. So once I started playing around with this and like it started clicking in my head, I jumped into Photoshop and I was like, I want, you know, I want to visualize this. And I, I thought it would be useful to show at the, here at NAB how this works and like how you can wrap your brain around this. Because if you remember before, we created a solid in fields and it was white, right? And then we created a spherical fall off, which is basically this. It's a gradient. That's all it is. And we set the transfer mode to subtract. Boom. So if you remember, there was buildings on the outside, but not buildings on the inside, right? Then we added a noise, right? We added that random field, and we set that to overlay. So I added a noise here in Photoshop, and I just set it to overlay. And you can see what it did to the edge there. It broke up the in-between values. It's not going to do anything to the full black. It's not going to do anything to the full white, because overlay is only going to be affecting the in-between values. Then I added an, inver an invert, right? And that's when we had the buildings just happening on the spherical falloff, and boom. Adjustment layer in Photoshop, invert. So I hope this is sort of tracking. It's very easy to understand. Once you start to think about it in this simple way, it's super, super powerful. All right. So in a nutshell, that's some fields. But let's go ahead and delete this and start laying down our city, because that's going to be way more fun. All right. So we have our polygon, or our polygon selection. We have our fields here. We're going to delete. I'm actually going to leave the solid layer on and delete that. And we are going to cut out some parks. We have some trees over here. We want some parks in here. We want to make it you know, sort of a, a nice place to live. You don't want to live in a, just a sea of buildings. So let's drop down a shader field, which is no, no, not really that much different than a shader effector. And the shader field is going to be really powerful in this workflow. We're going to grab the shader field and come down here and grab a noise, right? So before I jump into the noise, I'm going to make sure that I set the shader field to subtract. Because whatever white values I put in the shader field, I want it to subtract from my city, OK? So let's jump in here, and we'll say subtract. All right, come into here. For the noise, I'm going to use a cell noise, which is naturally sort of these like blocks of values, right? So with that, I can then clamp this down. I'm going to bring the low clip up. So I'm basically, I'm going to get fewer, fewer uh, blocks and more of like bits of white blocks, right? So let's just kind of clamp this down a bit. And now I'm just going to adjust the global scale. And now you can imagine everywhere that I'm subtracting buildings, I'm eventually going to put a park there. So that's pretty good. That's kind of a lot. I might make the parks a little bit bigger. All right, cool. Let's go back and add another park. We're going to add another shader field to this. We're going to set this to subtract as well. All right, jump in here, grab another noise, grab the noise, jump into that one, change it back to cellular noise again. Let's clamp this one even more. So this one, I might want like uh, bigger parks than the last one. That's good. All right. So now I might change that seed, though. Let's go ahead and change that seed until we find something that we like. We're just looking for something that looks organic and kind of cool. I like that one. I think we'll have a nice little park here in the center, which will be nice. All right, so with that being said, let's, uh, let's close down this cloner, grab our polygon selection. So we just created uh, a couple of fields that is subtracting from our solid that we're going to put parks in. So this is another really rad feature, being able to multi-select these fields and then put them into a 
group, right? Because we might want to use these somewhere else later on. So we can group these fields. We're going to say new group field, and then we're going to come up here and rename it parks. So all of it went away. Like, all the selections went away, right? So why is that? Why did that happen? Why did all my parks just go away? Because it's like, imagine this. Imagine like if you're in Photoshop and you created a group of layers, and those layers all have different transfer, transfer modes, but then so does the group, right? So that's what happened here. So I put them into a group, and they're subtracting still. If I grab the parks, these two shader fields are subtracting, but they're subtracting nothing, right? So we have to add these two together, obviously, right? So we're going to add, and we're going to say add. So I've just changed these both shader fields, so both of those noises are basically adding on top of each other. So out of that shader group, we now have a good value. Now we can go back into our regular fields and change our group to subtract. And now we're back to where we were. So once you start wrapping your head around how this stuff works, it becomes a lot easier, a lot more fun. All right, so now we, start, we need to start dropping down some buildings, right? So let's grab another shader field, which is obviously you're seeing a pattern here. The shader field is extremely powerful with this type of workflow. And we are going to grab a surface tile, OK? I'm also going to set this to subtract as well. Let's try to get a little bit more space here. Yeah, there we go. All right, so let's jump into the tile. And we're going to make our grout white, because those are going to actually become our roads. It's just a typical tile map, nothing crazy here. Let's bring all our other values down to black. Here's a nice little trick. If you have a color swatch, you can just drag the other one to create a copy of that color. A little trick for those of you that don't know that one. And now I'm just going to come in here and start to pick out like, how I want my blocks to look. Like, how wide do I want my streets? Something like that actually feels pretty darn good. And I can already see that we're going to have our parks in here in cool places, but maybe I want to visualize it without the parks. So I'll turn off the parks for a minute. So we got one road, and I'm going to add another set of roads. So I'm going to grab another shader field, and maybe this time we'll do, yeah, we'll do the same thing. We'll grab a tile, and in this one, we're going to go ahead and make our grout white again. And we'll make this black. And we're just going to drag these down to copy those colors. Now it's the exact same size, and everything is the, is the last one. So we're going to make the scale a little bit bigger. And then I'm also going to offset one of these guys. And maybe make the scale a little bit bigger. Eh, maybe not quite that big. Something like that. So we have some areas that might be turnarounds, or maybe parking lots or something. Something kind of interesting there. Actually, we should set this to subtract. That's my bad. Let's do that. OK, so that's actually not exactly what I want. Let's scale this up. I'm just trying to break up the roads a little bit to make it feel a little bit less grid-like. That feels pretty good. And I'm going to stretch it in one direction. Let's try like something like that, breaking up that road there. Really thin block here, but that's fine. All right, so now we have our roads. We can turn our, turn our parks back on. And we have the building blocks now. <laughs> a little pun there. Uh, <laughs> it's early, folks. Uh, so now it's, we're ready to put our parks in, right? But the parks need trees, right? So we need to add some trees to this. How are we going to add the trees only where they should go? How do we do that? Well, it's actually really, really easy. The first thing I'm going to do is build a cloner for our trees, because we haven't done that yet. So I'm going to say MoGraph Cloner. Again, Cloner is a fantastic way to duplicate objects and animate objects in Cinema 4D. It's one of the fav my favorite parts of it, actually. Drag that into a cloner, do the same thing, make this object. We're going to turn off Fix Clone. We're going to use Multi Instance. Uh, random is fine. We're going to use that same ground plane as our object. But this time, we do not want to use Polygon Center, because Polygon Center is going to be way too uniform. We want to spread them around, make them way more organic. So we're going to use it as a surface distribution, and we're going to up this by quite a bit. Uh, in fact, we're going to do 12,000, which before R20, that would have been insanity. All right, so now uh, they're duplicating out into space. I'm not really sure why they're all out there like that. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. We'll figure that out in a minute. Uh, they shouldn't have any local transforms. Hmm. Oh, align cone, fix cone. I, I, I ticked the wrong button, folks. That's my bad. It's early. All right, so now we've got our trees happening everywhere, right? That's not what we want. We want them to happen only in the parks. So this is a cool thing that I, I wasn't really, I didn't even know you could do this until recently. I can select this polygon selection tag. Holding down control, I can actually duplicate that tag. I've just duplicated that polygon selection tag along with it all the fields that I created, right? All the fields are still live. There, there's not duplicate fields in here. I just 
to create a duplicate of this polygon selection. So let's rename this guy trees. Right? Now let's jump into our cloner for our trees. Let's just name this parks. And we're going to drag that polygon selection into our selection input of our cloner. So it's still not there yet, Chad. What's going on here? We got our trees happening exactly where our buildings are happening, and that's not what we want, right? So we jump into the fields. What should we do here? How do we fix this? Well, it's very easy. If you remember, we had our parks being subtracted out of our solid, and then we had our, our buildings being, or sorry, our roads being subtracted out of all that. All we got to do is drop down an invert, right? Because we just need to invert what the parks were doing. The parks were subtracting, right? So we drop down an invert, we throw that right above the parks, and now we have parks right where we need them. They're not in the roads, they're in the, in the vicinities of our, of our, uh, you know, our places of nature. I like this little park right here. That's nice and cute. Another thing you can do uh, with uh, cloners, especially with these trees, we might want them to not all clump together. We have some that are like sort of interpenetrating here, and we don't want that. We can grab our, our parks, and we can say, MoGraph effector, push apart. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to take every particle, or not particle in this case, clones, and try to push them apart from each other by 100 centimeters and an iteration of 10. Now, you don't really need to worry about that for this, but let's change our max radius down to 10, maybe even something smaller. These are pretty tiny. So let's do two, something like that. So now they're not going, to, they're going to try to stay away from each other, and it's going to look a lot prettier when we sort of look out here. They're actually a little bit too uniform for my taste, so I might like, like make that like 1.5. That's better. So now I know that none of them are going to be like interpenetrating, but they're also going to look still pretty organic. And of course, all of this is procedural, so if I wanted to come back in and maybe grab one of these earlier shader fields and change the seed, we can get parks and buildings somewhere new every time you change the seed. It's fantastic. It's a great way to work, and it's super flexible. So if your client comes over and they're like, you know what, I like what you're doing here, but I don't really like that park right there. Can we try something else? Uh, yeah, no problem. Just grab your shader field. Maybe grab this one. That's uh, the first park that we did. Just change the seed. Great. Oh, and uh, you know what? client came in, they said they don't like that road, they want to change the road, so maybe we just like mess around with the U scale on that, or maybe we mess around with the, uh, the Y. But anyway, like the, well, actually, I like this better. I don't know what I just did there, but we're going to call that a happy accident right there. <laughs> I kind of like that better than the other roads. These roads are a bit wide, but whatever. All right, so you're kind of getting the idea, right? So let's do one more really cool thing that I absolutely love in fields. You remember me saying, like, we're going to talk about quantizing, quantized falloffs? It's a really complicated word, but it's really not. So one of the things that I absolutely uh, hate is like seeing repeat, repetitive patterns, like seeing the, uh, I, feel, I think this is kind of lazy. We have two buildings here facing the same direction. In fact, all of the buildings are facing the exact same direction. We want them to be random, you know? You want it to look organic. You want to look like somebody hand placed that stuff. So how do we randomly rotate all of these buildings uh, without you know, wanting to kill ourselves, basically? So we grab our cloner. In the past, I would have probably said, well, you know, maybe I, need like a, maybe I need like a random effector, right? That's random. If I go into the parameter, if I hit position and rotate, maybe I change the random. Well, that's great, but they're all like off grid. Like that, nobody's going to build a city like that, right? I mean, it looks very organic, but it looks like it was like designed by you know, a crazy person or something. So how do we get them to randomly rotate just in 90 degrees? Because that's all we needed, right? So let's grab random. Let's kill that. Uh, let's see if I can get that delete key to work. All right, so grab the cloner. We're going to do it with a plane effector. The plane effector is one of the most versatile effectors in MoGraph. You can use it to do so many amazing things. And in this part of the demo, we're going to use it to randomly rotate our buildings by 90 degrees uh, very, very easily. So if I, if I uncheck position, now we're not really doing anything. Let's turn on rotation, and let's change our rotation to 360, right? They didn't move. They didn't change. Because I just rotated them all 360. They ended up exactly back where they were before, right? So all right, bear with me. When we do that, and then we go into the falloff system, again, we mentioned fields is basically just falloffs on steroids with a Photoshop kind of wrapper. We can use falloffs in uh, effectors as well. So if we go into the falloff, and we change our field to a random field, right? They do the same thing that we just had before. They all rotate randomly. That's not what we want. But 
if we go under the remapping tool, you can see that this fall off has a linear sort of uh, re a linear sort of mapping. And if you toggle down to contour way down here, you can change the contour mode of that curve from none to quantize. Now, all quantize is is it's just dividing that into equal sections, right? Dividing that 360 degrees that we made into equal sections. In our case, it's got two, it's got, well, one step, right? So let's increase that. I started thinking like, all right, 360. I want it to rotate 90 degrees. 90 goes into 360 four times. So maybe I'll just try a step of four. Boom, done. So right now, each clone is getting a random value between zero and 360 but it's quantized to 90 degrees. Is that tracking? So now all I have to do is go back into my field. I can change the seed, and now we get organic sort of random rotation on all of these little wood buildings in our scene, all happening. So now we don't have any of that gross, repetitive pattern. I like this little park we got going over here. All right, so now we can kind of toggle that around. And it also gives you this nifty little visual uh, aid here to see what that random field is actually doing, which is really, really helpful. All right, so once I uh, started figuring out how, how this fields worked and the multi-instancing and, and just all of it, I started to, my brain started to go crazy. So I'm going to open up a new scene for you. So I wanted to see if I could actually create a city growing from a cannonball, <laughs> which is really weird. But I just want to see if I could do it. So I'm just going to play this down. So we have our cannonball shoot at the plane, and wherever that cannonball lands, a city is born. And this one I went a little crazy, and I even added some boxes and some traffic going down the roads and stuff. But it's the same exact principles that we just went through, right? The only difference is I'm not driving it with a polygon selection. I'm driving it with a particle, right? So let's go back and look at that for a second. I'm not going to spend too much time in this one. I just wanted to show it to you to like spark your imagination a little bit about what's possible. So if we go into the fields now, before we had a solid in the other scene, and this, one, this time we have an emitter. So you can bring particle emitters in here. So a particle gets emitted from the cannon. That's all one single particle with a little, I think it's a cylinder on there, a tube or something. It shoots out. Wherever that particle lands, it creates a polygon selection. Boom, polygon selection. Then. With that freeze layer, you have this really cool mode called grow. And what that does is over time, that polygon selection is going to say, oh, I want to grow 55 centimeters. Boink. Next frame, boink, boink, boink. Keeps growing and growing and growing. I, I decay that to sort of slow that effect down. Otherwise, it would be like so fast, I wouldn't even be able to see it. And then the same shader fields that I used before to knock the buildings out, or sorry, the streets out and the parks out. Same exact theory, right? Actually, before we jump in, so that's really powerful. Like once you start to wrap your brain about how, around how this works, you can really start to create some really interesting effects. And I think you've seen probably a lot of people using it for, for growth on uh, animated vertex maps, but it's equally as powerful on polygon selections as well. So jumping back into our original scene, I did want to show you one last thing that I did forget, which is, you know, you promised us that you were going to grow the city on, and I didn't do that. So let me, let me fulfill that, that promise. Let's go back into our fields here. And all we're going to do is add a spherical field to this. Okay, The spherical field, I'm going to set to clip. So you can see what it's done here. It's clipped out everything outside of our spherical field. So now I'm going to add that exact same spherical field to my parks. I'm going to do the same thing. Clip. Now with one sphere, this is how easy this is. Like it literally takes two seconds. Now we just like scale our spherical field up, T for scale, and we're just going to scale that up. And now we can just move it down, hitting E for moving. We're going to rotate or just move this way down. And now we have a cool organic blah 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 blah. Sound effects are free, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm here the next half hour. Um, yeah, so it's super easy to do this stuff, and it's so much fun. It's a real blast to actually start using this stuff. So, all right, so that's pretty cool. So um, once I started creating something with a few, like, hundred buildings, I wanted to see if I could make something with a lot of buildings. So this one, I've actually created an insane city grid with, like, tons and tons of buildings and tons and tons of trees. And you're noticing that they're all dots right now. That's because, if you remember before, I showed you guys how we're using the multi-instance mode with a viewport mode of points. 
because trying to display this as geometry is going to be super freaking heavy, and you're not going to be able to or orbit your camera around. But you can see I've got so many buildings in here, and I'm able to move my camera around freely. It's not a big deal. And the best part is these will show up at render time. All right, so we're going to jump into some Redshift now. I'm super stoked on this announcement right here, Redshift being part of the Maxon family. I'm extremely excited. In fact, uh, I've been using Redshift for a, a quite some time, and we have some fantastic training on Redshift uh, at GSG, on GSG's website. I highly recommend checking that out. All right, so now we're using some Redshift. I just changed my layout up here, which is another great thing about Cinema 4D, the ability to change your layout, create layouts that match your needs for whatever production you're in. Uh, so this is the layout that I use when I'm doing any sort of look dev. We're going to use Redshift here. Uh, full disclosure, I do have a dome light in the scene already pre-built. I have HDRI Link, which is a, a plugin that we make at Grayscale Gorilla on here. Uh, and then we don't have any shaders yet, so I'm just going to go ahead and fire off the render view, which is a real-time interactive render preview. Uh, and we're gonna, just going to zoom in here. Now, that, my friends, is a lot of buildings. We've got some nice depth of field happening here as well. In fact, we can just jump out of this camera. I mean, that is a lot of geometry. And by the way, this geometry is tessellated. In the previous version, you may, have re you may remember, these buildings were sort of faceted. So not only is this a lot of geometry, but Redshift is actually tessellating or smoothing out that geometry for me at render time, which is another great feature. All right, so let's add some materials to this thing. So let's jump into one of our cameras. That one's a good one. All right, we got some nice depth of field happening on our camera tag. We've got no shaders or anything happening, so let's fix that. We're going to use the Everyday Material Collection, uh, which is a Grayscale Gorilla product as well. It's called EMC, where we have 350 materials of all different kinds uh, for use in everyday work. So we're going to jump into the wood category and change our uh, view mode to icons, sort of scale these up. I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab Maple 02, and I'm going to grab Pine 02. And we are going to assign these to our objects. Let's grab pine, and let's throw that onto our ground plane. And we're going to use the maple onto our buildings. And we'll leave the trees alone for now. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and turn these trees off. I'm just hitting our little stoplights to get them out of the scene. I'm going to change my wood pine scale to maybe three, because it's going to be way too big otherwise. So basically, I'm tiling this texture to make sure that we're not seeing too much of the grain on that wood. All right, this is already looking pretty darn good. I didn't have to do a whole lot to this. But I will say this. I don't want every single building to be the exact same shade of wood. I want them to be a little bit different. Maybe they're cut from different trees. So we need to vary up this wood a little bit, specifically the color. All right, so let's jump into that wood shader. And if you haven't played around with Redshift's nodes, you do not need to be afraid of them. They are fantastic, very, very powerful way of working. All right? So let's do this. How do, we, how do we get some random values out of this cloner system into Redshift? Well, because they're multi-instances, it sort of limits us a little bit. Because really, Cinema, in, in our case, Redshift here, is seeing all of these really as one object. So it's, not, it's going to be sort of difficult to get some random values out of this. Well, not with fields, actually. So if I grab this building cloner, and I grab our trusty plane effector, and we create this plane effector, and you see all the buildings went up into the air because I have to turn off my position. So now they pop back to normal. Now we can go down to this color mode right here. So fields, our effectors can actually affect colors, right? So let's go to the color mode and make sure that's set to fields color. We don't have any fields on here yet, but we're going to. We're going to go into the fall off, and now we're going to add a random field, OK? Now, you notice before when we did some fields, we didn't have this little line and this little three-circle icon. That's because when polygon selections are, when you're using fields with polygon selections, there's no colors to be had, right? But in this mode, I can use colors. So if I turn on color, you're going to notice all of my dots just changed colors, right? They all change colors. Everything's all good. So, but that's good, but our wood didn't change. It's the same wood, so how do we fix that? Well. Redshift has some nifty nodes, and I'm just opening up the command search here, which is new in Redshift. Uh, I have it hot keyed to control tab, but you can do it to anything you want. So I'm going to just start typing color user data. 
Now that sounds complicated, but it's not because they give you some nifty fly downs on exactly what you can connect this to. And in our case, we're going to connect it to display color because that's exactly what our fields just did. Our, deal, our fields just randomly put a color in the display, right? So if I publish this node out to the surface now, which is basically like soloing a layer, we get random colors on our buildings. Super useful, right? So how do we turn that into something that we can randomize that wood texture? Because really, that's what we want to be doing right now. So let's try. Like, how do we think of I had to think about this for a minute. And it, it's a little tricky. And I'm hoping sometime they make this process a little bit easier. But for right now, this is kind of is, is how I use, I'm, I'm doing it. So we need to convert this into a value. Because right now, it's RGB. We need to get a value so that we can drive some of the values in our color correction. Anyway, bear with me. So let's put down a HSV node. So we are going to convert RGB to HSV. And HSV, if you don't know, stands for hue saturation value. And we need the value. That's what we want. We want value out of this. We don't need the hue. We don't need the saturation. We don't need that. So let's go ahead and connect in a splitter. Because you have to start thinking about it this way, right? HSV are three values. It's a vector, right? One, two, three, right? So if we split this with a color splitter, and we keep thinking, OK, HSV is one, two, three. Our output is RGB. So R would be H, S would be G, and B would be value, right? So now check this out. I, I take the B out, boink, and I plunk it into the surface, and we have value. So now we have value, right? So now we can do something with this value, which is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and grab a color correction node, which is awesome. You can color correct textures very, very easily. All right, grab the color correct. We're gonna, I'm just going to... I could put this directly into, let's say, the gamma and look at this, right? Let's go ahead and now put that to the surface. And it does not look right at all, right? Because we haven't told it what the value is. We need to map these values to something that makes sense, right? So let's just try that. I don't know. Like Once you start learning the nodes and you're like, well, I think I would probably want to remap that. Let me see if there's a remap. Um, well, maybe there's a range or something. Oh, change range. Let's try that. So once you start to understand the things you need, then the nodes aren't as intimidating. Because all you have to do is start searching the things you need, and chances are you'll find it. So let's put this, this value into a change range, which basically all I'm doing is saying, well, my old range was 0 to 1 in value, and now I can change the output value to anything I want. So in our case, I know gamma is set to 1. So I don't want it to go too crazy. I don't want it to like, blow out my gamma. So I might do like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, oops, 0.9. And my max will be 0.1. So basically what this means is that I've taken all those bright values and differences of colors of those buildings, and I've clamped it down. Now I can send this to that gamma. And we're going to see uh, something is not working here. Let's just make sure. Oh, duh. For those of you at home yelling at me, I, it helps to connect the texture input, to the texture output to the input of the color correction, because the color correction is basically like, hey, man, I don't know what you're trying to do, but it ain't working. All right, cool. So we got that set up. And now I can start to come in here and just tweak this gamma down. And you can see we're getting slightly different colors in our buildings now. This is one shader that's going to drive probably, I would say, over 80,000 buildings. So it's going to look like I have 80,000 shaders, but I only have one. And that's really powerful, right? OK, so we've got that set up. Let's see if we can do even more with this. Right now, we just dropped, we're just tweaking that gamma. I might want to tweak, let's say, uh, the saturation. So I'm going to grab all these nodes. I'm going to hold down Control. And that's just going to spit out a copy of those. And because I don't need another color zoo data, because I've already got it here, the power of nodes, behold the power of nodes, splitting that off into this node. Now I have a completely separate tree for doing something completely different with that value. The reason that I split the entire thing out, I'm going to show you in a minute. And if I could work my pen, I could move that over. All right, so now we want to do saturation. What do we want our max saturation to be? Maybe like 1.1 or something like that. Min saturation, maybe we want like 0.7. That's probably good. All right, so let's drag that out into the saturation. And boom. Now you're going to see some of them sort of lost a little bit of their saturation, right? And now maybe I'll do one more. And if there's time, I'll show you another really cool trick. But we'll see. We're running a little bit. I'm running a little bit long. All right, let's split that out. Sometimes it takes like surgical precision to move these things with a Wacom pen. But here I am doing surgery. 
All right, let's throw this one into value. I don't see value here. Here's a cool trick. You don't see value here in the node. I'm sorry, I'm just going to drag it from over here, plop it down, done. All right, that's a cool trick. Drive value, boom, level, done. All right, so level, see, this is the issue that I have with this workflow, right? I'm splitting one color user data off, right? So really what I'm doing is I keep randomizing the same buildings. You saw that same building change hue. You saw that same building change saturation. That's not really random in my book. I want more random. So we're going to do a cool trick. And I'm going to kind of blaze through this one a little bit because it's a little bit weird. And uh, we're going to use what's called a vector div. I don't expect anybody, including myself, to fully understand what this is doing, but it does work until we have like a, a better sort of randomization feature in here. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to pipe this into input one, and we're going to pipe that into our first H color to HSV. And instead of looking at exactly the entire shader, I'm actually just want to look at the value because I really want to show you guys what this is doing. Now let's see if I can get it this time. Eh, right there. OK, so that's actually, OK, cool. So the vector div is basically going to be dividing in RGB, right? So remember RGB vector value. So let's go ahead and change this to maybe 1. And we're going to change this to maybe 0.5. Cool. Wow, dude, what is going on with my typing? 0.5, there we go. And then like maybe 1, OK? So we just randomized this even further, right? So that's cool, but we need to do that three times. So let's drag that guy out. I'm going to pump that into input one, throw that into color HSV. And now I'm just going to take these numbers and change it again, maybe 0.5. And maybe this one is going to go to one. And maybe this one goes to two. And I'm just picking arbitrary numbers. I'm not really trying to get too crazy with it. And we'll do the same thing again down here. What I'm doing is I've managed to take one random color driven by fields and completely change it three times. So I'm getting three for the price of one right now. So let's go ahead and output this out to our diffuse. And now we're going to see the whole thing come together if I did everything right, which I hope I did. And boom. So now we have three levels of random randomization coming from one user data driven by fields using user data in Redshift. It sounds complicated, but it's not. And if you want to see how this is done, if you go to grayscalegorilla.com slash NAB, I'm going to be giving this scene away so you can dissect it yourself. You can play with it. Obviously, we can't include the buildings, but there'll be boxes in there. But you'll get the same principles. So if you're trying to figure out this on your own, this, is a, this will be a great way to do that. All right, so we got the buildings done. Now let's do some stuff with the trees, because the trees are cool. We're going to do something completely different on the trees, like another cool feature. All right, so let's duplicate this material. I'm just holding down Control and dragging to duplicate that material. We're going to call this one trees. Let's bring our trees back in. All right, there's our trees. Wait for those to pop in. They're all white. So let's grab our shader. We're going to apply it to our tree cloner. And all of them are going to turn into wood, which is fine. But we don't want white. We don't want like the, you know, the regular brown wood. We want them to be green. So I'm going to actually not use any of this stuff that we just created. Delete that. Boom. Because we're not going to do this the same way that we did the other, uh, the other set. So let's, what are we, how are we going to do this? Well, we're gonna, like I mentioned, we're going to do this with fields, right? Fields are super po powerful. We already have this color user data, so I'm actually going to push that out to the viewport. So let's grab our tree cloner, and we need to put some random green on these trees. So again, we're going to use our trusty planar effector, plane effector. And we are going to use, let's go make sure that we turn off the parameters position, and we go into the fall off. We're going to actually use some more cool fields. And this time, we're going to use a random field. Boom. So the random field we're going to use, and we're going to set this from, uh, we're going to say, I'm going to turn on color. And we're going to go to color remap, and we're going to drop down to gradient. So you notice before, I could have done this before, right? I could have just done that. I could have, I could have got this value without having to go through the HSV, to the color splitter, blah, blah, blah. There's a million ways to do things. And that's what I want you guys to think about. There's not one right way. There's a million right ways. 
And like that's the beauty of, uh, of R20 and, and, and Cinema 4D in general, is that there's always a, a, a ton of cool ways. All right, so we got that. Let's just change the color, right? Let's bring in some green. All right, maybe this, this one's a little bit lighter green. All right, so now we have some green trees, but they're just like solid green because we're soloing out this layer or this node, and it's just like not really what we want. So we need to actually sort of put this on top of our wood texture. So how would we do that? Well, in Photoshop, I would add this as a layer, right? So let's see if there's a layer, color layer. OK, cool. This feels familiar. Let's go ahead and grab our wood texture and put that into our base. I'm going to go ahead and solo out that node so we can see it in our viewport. Uh, why is it black? Let's go ahead and figure out why that's black. Oh, layer one is enabled, my bad. So now we need to add a layer. It's like dragging a layer in Photoshop, right? So let's take that color, that green color. We're going to put that into layer one. And let's go ahead and select that. And we're going to turn on, uh, we're going to change our blending mode to multiply. And we're going to bring down the opacity a little bit. I'm not really sure why that's not turning green. I think somehow, oh. Our, no, our display color, oh, is that set correctly? Display color. That was green a second ago. I'm not insane, am I? No, that's right. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Color user data. I'll put that to the viewport. Hmm. Strange. It was green a second ago, but we're going to move on. So we'll just try something else. In our case, I'm just going to go boink. And for the sake of the demo, we're going to change this color to green. Not really sure what happened there, but we're just going to move on with it. Interesting. OK, let's push that out to the viewport. All right, so now we're getting some green color into that. And we can actually come in here and start to increase that opacity, just like in Photoshop. Very, very simple to do. Uh, I am a little bit curious. And I, if, it, if I weren't doing this live, I would try to troubleshoot what happened to my color user data there. But whatever reason, I'm going to move on. All right, so we have some green color in our buildings, or in, sorry, in our trees, and we can push this back out to our base diffuse. Boom. And let's look at that guy. We're going to output the entire thing, and now we have some green trees. So let's fly our camera around a little bit, see what we got cooking. We got a lot of buildings. We also have the ability in Redshift to do these cool fisheye lenses, which are really kind of cool for these neat, like, wide-angle shots. Let's just dive into one of these close-ups here. All right, that's feeling pretty good. Another thing that I really love about Redshift is the post effects. So Red has these really nifty. I'm going to undock my uh, render view so we can make this a little bit bigger for everybody. All right, so the post effects in Redshift are accessed by this little, this little wheel over here. And if I toggle that open, you're going to notice that I have a couple of these already enabled. So I'm using a LUT, a lookup table, uh, which is essentially going to be like a little color grade happening in my render view, right? And at Grayscale Gorilla, we saw some really cool LUTs, and we also have some really cool free ones, too. In fact, I'm going to use one of the free ones right now. I'm going to grab uh, our Kodak D65 LUT, which is basically going to make my render view look more like a film response. It's going to feel more filmic, and I'm gonna allow, it's going to allow me to do a little bit of color grading right here in the render view in Redshift. And with that, I can adjust the opacity of that LUT, so I can bring it down from nothing all the way up to one. So this is a cool LUT that you can get for free on our blog. We have some other ones in this free pack as well. We have, if I just hold this down and I arrow, I can start to arrow through them. So this is a really neat one. It's kind of like a very warm look. We have some, uh, this one's called analog, kind of a washed out look. And then we even have some really other cool ones like a black and white look, a silver screen. But I'm going to go back down to this one, which is mid-century. I really like this one. So that's, that's these post effects are extremely powerful once you start to understand how they work. You can also do some really interesting little photographic exposure stuff. So it's like tone mapping. So those of you who uh, do architectural visualization renders or whatnot, I'm sure you're familiar with tone mapping. So what this does is it gives us a more sort of filmic response curve. In fact, I can turn on allow desaturation. Now, if I turn that on and off, it's pretty subtle. But what that's doing is it's actually desaturating my highlights, which actually looks a lot more filmic than, uh, let's say, if I didn't. So it's a little bit difficult to see in here, but you can sort of tell, if I toggle it on and off, some of that warm tone got out of my highlights, which I really actually like. I don't want those to be super blown out yellow. 
The other thing I can do is I can, I can adjust exactly how far I'm, allowed this, I'm allowing this to overexpose a little bit. So I'm changing the allowed overexposure and sort of like softening up. It's almost like a soft clip if you, if you do any sort of color grading. Uh, the other thing that I really like are the blooms. Now in this scene, it's not, super, it's not super practical to have any blooms, but we'll throw some on anyway. So you can actually create little render time blooms that happen extremely fast. Let's bring the threshold way down and the intensity way up. Way, way down. There we go. So if you want to create like a, 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 diffuse, a diffusion lens, like almost like you took your lens and like smeared it with like uh, Vaseline or something. It's it, in, in a subtle way in the scene, it actually kind of works. I wouldn't keep it, I wouldn't make it like heavy, like anything like that. That's just too much. But it does help make it feel like there's some atmosphere and like the light in the scene is actually hitting particulate and like diffusing the scene a little bit. And that helps a lot. So if I turn this all the way down to zero, that's where we are. If I turn it all the way down, up, it's, it's a very subtle effect. But hey, we are in the business of subtlety sometimes when we're doing color grades and looks like this. So that, my friends, is my image. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these other camera angles. And I'm actually going to turn the bloom off on that one because it's a bit heavy. And I'm going to change my LUT to maybe our first LUT, which is the D65 LUT, because I think that looks cooler. Change that back down there. So yeah, so in a nutshell, fields are super powerful, especially when you couple them with multi-instance cloning, especially when you start to use them with all of the features in Redshift, the user data, the nodes. Again, this is one material driving, God, probably 100,000 buildings. It's all procedural. I can hit one seed on all this stuff, and everything would change. Same goes for the, for the trees. The placement of the parks, everything is completely procedural. We just change a few seeds, we get a completely different city. So that is how that works, and I think I'm about wrapped up here. How am I doing on time? And there's, we good? Am I done? I'm out of time? All right, great. Perfect timing. All right, let's bring up my fancy slideshow again. So my name is Chad Ashley. Uh, again, I'm from Grayscale Gorilla. Visit us at grayscalegorilla.com slash NAB to get this scene and others. And uh, thank you very much for your time.